Okay, so uh, we're at lecture three now. You had homework number one due today. You submit it via the um, via Carmen. Um, was homework two? I for, I just forget what I put on the website. Was homework two assigned today? Next week. No, assigned next week. Okay. Um, so you have a week reprieve. Today we're going to talk about moral frameworks for for engineering ethics. Um, and uh, in particular, these will be frameworks uh, that will help your thinking about ethical cases. All right. Um, so why would we use a moral framework? Because it eliminates the connections between engineering code of ethics, things like we talked about last time, and everyday morality. It helps us make choices and resolve dilemmas. So the first moral framework that some people live in and think about all the time is the, the, the so-called utilitarianism. So utilitarianism can be um, thought of as the most good for the most people. Okay, the most good for most people giving equal consideration to everyone affected. Okay, now that can be a dictate in engineering. Um, the question is, is, is what is the most good, okay? Um, if I'm making a, uh, a car, is the most good the, um, you know, the most miles drive that are accident free? Or is it the most miles drive with the least amount of pollution? Um, and so forth. So it's very difficult to know what is your criterion that you would have um, for utilitarianism, okay? So from the codes, um, one of the, the prime dictates for engineering um, ethics is this engineers shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public and the performance of professional duties. And the answer to this question, is it related, is certainly yes. I mean, um, utilitarianism is at play in this because you're trying to have, in this statement, most people would interpret it as is you want the most people possible safe, most people possible healthy, and the welfare of the people to be mo most people to be most positively affected by what you do. The problem is, 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 is that sometimes ignores um, some of the ethical decision making. So for instance, a lot of times what we'll be talking about later is, is that there'll, there'll sort of be a trade-off between money and hurting people, that is safety. Okay, uh, that trade-off is very basic to engineering ethics, um, and uh, it's very difficult to deal with. Uh, you, it is it, one of the things that we'll learn is is that it is impossible to make something completely safe. Okay, so that no one's injured. I mean, how how could you ever do that? Okay, we'll discuss that. Um, so. When it comes to the most good for the most people, we'll try to keep as many people safe as possible, given, um, I'm gonna have to start taking attendance at the start of class, right? Uh, so, the, um, you're trying to make sure that as many people as um, possible are safe for a given amount of money um, spent, and you have to know what's acceptable in terms of standards and so on and so forth, okay? So, in terms of uh, uh, the way engineers think, we often um, apply what's called cost-benefit analysis to um, this sort of utilitarianism idea. It's not actually the same, but it is, does have some relation. So, in a typical cost-benefit analysis, it says the, the good and bad consequences are all quantified in terms of dollars. You know, it's good that our company makes this much money. It's bad that we're going to have to pay warranty or um, we're going to have to pay for litigation because our product was unsafe and so on. Okay. Um, so the question then becomes when, it, when, it, when you're talking about, for instance, automobile safety um, or other types of safety, is how do you put a dollar on a human life? If you know that the statistics tell you that if you spend a hundred more dollars on this part, then, um, then you'll save, you know, 20 lives. Well, then <laughs> where's the trade-off point, all right? Those are really difficult decisions that engineers are put into. And don't think engineers aren't. They really are because the safety 
the electronic systems on a, for instance, an automobile that I know a number of you will end up designing, you know, come down to that. They could be made safer um, if they spent more money on it. It can be more reliable. You could save more lives, but the company will say, yeah, but we'll never sell a car then. We're going to have to accept that some people are going to get hurt or killed. Okay. So these are very um, difficult decisions. Okay, and in these, a lot of times what it comes down to is, is, is you got a safe design versus a warranty, okay, on a product to fix it, okay, versus the loss of lives, the legal issues associated with those, and the costs associated with those, okay. So we can, we can all put dollar values on, on human lives. The U.S. government does it, for instance. They, they, uh, my understanding is, is it's based on uh, your earning potential over your lifetime, okay? And um, they, then, then <laughs> that gets really controversial, but that's the way it's often done in the court of law. Okay. Now, there's also the so-called rights ethics and duty ethics. In rights ethics, um, human rights is the, it's said to be the moral bottom line. That is, that human dignity and respect are fundamental. There's two classes of rights, and you hear politicians arguing about them all the time. There's the so-called liberty rights. Those are the rights to exercise one's liberty that lead to duties of others not to interfere with one's um, freedom. Or there's welfare rights, where you have rights to um, benefits needed for a decent human life. So what's the relevance of rights to codes? Well, um, this this statement here, again, I keep returning to the engineers will paramount safety, health, and welfare of the public, performance of professional duties. That refers to every individual. That is, every person that's getting the products that you're going to be creating as an engineer has a certain right with respect to that product, such as a right not to be injured by your negligence for that product. Okay? So, um, or not to be killed by a, a product. All right? They also have um, a right to get a product in a, in a fair and honest exchange on a, on a, a, for some technology that, um, such that what you sell as an engineer works, functions properly, right? I mean, they, if you're going to sell them something and you're saying it's going to work this good, then it ought to work that good. Otherwise, well... There's lots of problems. There's an ethical issue at play, obviously. There's a professionalism issue at play. There's also an issue of whether your company will go out of business if they continue that type of um, behavior. Now, connected to um, rights or duties, um, so right actions are those required by duties to respect the liberty or autonomy of individuals. And there's a number of duties that are listed. Whenever you have someone has a right, there's almost always a corresponding duty by someone to help fulfill um, that right. Next, there's the so-called virtue ethics. These are these are the things that people talk about. Sometimes bosses talk about. Um, it emphasized character more than rights and rules. So competence, competence, as we saw, was a key part of professionalism. Um, honesty. We're going to be talking about honesty from a different a number of perspectives in this class. We'll talk about it from the perspective of, in the academic life, academic honesty. We'll talk about it as the engineer's honesty and stating specifications of what a product will do and so on. Um, I'll give you an example of courage in just a minute. Um, being fair, being loyal to your company. That's changed a lot over the years. Um, you know how loyal you're expected to be your company. And, um, Humility, in other words, don't be uh, sort of flamboyantly uh, bragging about your technological skills and so forth. So the question is, is relevance to codes? These virtue ethics are in there. They're state in the IEEE code. It says be honest in stating claims, improve your technical competence, treat fairly all persons independent of race, religion, all that, right? Um, so these, this sort of moral framework um, sort of plays through our codes of ethics, and it, it, it plays through our uh, sort of discussions about each other too. You know, if if someone gets a, a reputation, for instance, as being dishonest, that's really bad for their professional development and so forth. Um, so, what are the virtues in engineering? Um, focusing on the good of your clients, being client focused. 
many companies are client focused, right? Because they know who's paying the bills. I mean, they know who the customer is and they want to make sure that they're satisfied. You want to be a good customer focused organization and individual to make sure that you're doing an honest work and you're giving them a good product and then they're giving you a reasonable pay for that product. Um, public spirited virtues also include um, a focus on the good of the public so you're, you're consistently concerned about what's going to happen as a result of your products. Of course when, I, when we say the public that also includes the environment. Um, and then there's this issue of, of generosity um, that's sort of going beyond the minimum requirements and helping. So these are engineers who voluntarily give their time, talent, and money um, to the professional societies. Um, that is like volunteering for the IEEE. I've done myself a lot of volunteer work with the IEEE. Um, and uh, local communities, working with your local communities. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. There's also proficiency virtues. If anything, if you want to be perceived as a professional engineer, increase your competence. Be technically competent okay, um, in uh, your chosen field. Uh, another thing that really helps is, is that you're diligent. It's not just that you're competent and sit back, but you're diligent in being in your work and getting things done. Um, you know, you can think about that uh, software engineering case study that we did before. Um, being creative is often a component of professional competence, right? You want to hear your engineers speak up and have creative, good, new ideas because they lead to new products, new features, new functions, okay? So creativity is considered another key part of being a professional. Um, often in engineering, we work on teams um, and uh, it's important to try to work um, together effectively. I know that's difficult. I mean, people sometimes are really difficult to work together with, right? Um, but there's a strong need at companies. They want you to be collegial. I want you to cooperate with each other. They, when you go into a company and if you read the codes of ethics for a company, there's a heavy emphasis on loyalty to the company. In other words, doing the best thing for them. And everything else is unethical. There's a bit of that that goes on with um, um, codes of ethics. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, um, sometimes in this, uh, these company codes of ethics, there's also a, an emphasis on respect for authority. Um, now, with respect to these, um, these last two, um, you know, I'm not saying you need to be an anarchist and disagree with everything they're saying, but you got to be careful to balance. Um, I, I, I would look at a company's code of ethics and say, eh, do I need to follow everything here? Or are they really de-emphasizing the public, for instance? You know, you take um, a company's code of ethics and compare it to like an IEEE code of ethics, or better yet, the National Society of Professional Engineering code of ethics, you find a different tone, okay? I mean, theirs is very much oriented towards their business, their bottom line, and making sure um, that happens. Sometimes there's a lack of emphasis on some of the things that you may care about, um, not just the public, safety, health, and welfare, but maybe the environment, too. Um, so some companies, uh, in my view, need sort of an update in their closed ethics. Uh, I want to show you how to apply these moral frameworks to a case study. This is a case study we talked about um, earlier. Um, I'm going to read over it quickly, and then we're going to analyze this from those moral framework um, perspectives. So engineer A is employed by a software company, is involved in design, specialized software, in connection with the operations of facilities affecting the public health and safety. Those are nuclear air quality control, um, water quality control. As part of the design of a particular software system, Engineer A conducts extensive testing, and although the tests demonstrate that software is safe to use under existing standards, Engineer A is, uh, is aware of new draft standards that are about to be released by a standard setting organization, standards which the newly designed software may not meet. Testing is extremely costly and the company's clients are eager to begin to move forward. The software company is eager to satisfy its clients, which is good, um, protect the software company's finances, and 
protect existing jobs. But at the same time, the management of the software company wants to be sure that the software is safe to use. A series of tests proposed by engineer A will likely result in a decision whether to move forward with the use of the software. Tests are costly and will delay the use of the software by at least six months, which will put the company at a competitive disadvantage and cost the company a significant amount of money. Also, delaying implementation will mean the state public service commission utility rates will rise significantly during this time. The company requests engineers A's recommendation concerning the need for additional software testing. So in a moral framework, how do you think about such a case? Um, from a utilitarian perspective, hold sa paramount safety, health, and welfare to the public, well, you do the testing. I mean, if you're a utilitarian, if that's always your sp perspective, well, then you do the testing because the only people it's going to harm by doing the testing is your own company, which is relatively few people compared to many, many possible people. Okay? Um, so it seems that would be the most good for the most people. But you could do a cost-benefit analysis, um, analyze what costs will be to the company if there is a software failure versus cost of the test. Often that's what happens in a company. They'll do a cost-benefit analysis. Next, from a rights or duty ethics um, perspective, the public has a right to exposure to safe systems, not to be, engi not to be injured. Um, engineer has a right to provide an opinion on such an important matter. Engineer A could be, it could be in a company like this, they're not even asked, because they may say, oh, they're gonna just tell us we have to do more tests, we're not gonna listen to them. But engineer A has um, both a right and a duty uh, to comment on this important case about um, the, the software and how the subsequent system can affect um, the public. So they, this is connected with this statement that they have a duty to provide safe systems. So at the same time, the engineer has a duty to be loyal to the company. Now, we're going to... Uh, we're going to bring up this in a case study um, a little later in class, this whole issue of company loyalty. Um, company loyalty has uh, changed quite a bit in the last 20 years um, in the U.S. Um, there's been a general, uh, it, it seems that there's a general degradation of company loyalty. Um, and uh, it seems that, that that's not the fault of the engineers, the employees, but management seemed to start fight years ago and um, it's created quite a problem it, it it makes it difficult these days to be an engineer you know you know when i first was looking for a job uh it was unheard of for an engineering company to lay off an engineer period it just never happened you would you never hear of any company doing that now you know big problem or the, the, what, what, what's a little related to this is the issue of engineers being um, assigned jobs that take a long time and engineers doing a lot of work, right? And not just a standard 40 hour week. Um, that's grown over the years too. Um, engineers have gotten themselves in a tough position in that respect. So there's been a, a sort of a degradation in this sort of relationship it seems between um, employees um, um, and employers. Virtue ethics. Uh, first, competence. An engineer's competence in coming up with less expensive tests. We talked about that early on. That could be really good in this case. The engineer's honesty in whether to meet new standards or old standards. He's got to be really, this person has to be very careful in, in being honest about whether the standards are met or not. Um, courage. The engineer has to have the courage to make a tough decision. You, sometimes when you are an engineer and you're making a decision like this, if you make the decision that goes along with what the bosses are saying, it helps your career. But if you're perceived as somebody that's going to be going against what the bosses want, that can hurt your career quite a bit. This gets really tough at times. Um, loyalty. An engineer's loyalty to the company to protect protect them from lit litigation by testing for new standards. So it's kind of weird. On the one hand, an engineer like this may be perceived as not being loyal by proposing all these tests and costing the company a bunch of money, 
But on the other hand, they may be ultimately very loyal because they're protecting the company from litigation and problems. So it, it's very, it gets into very um, fuzzy areas um, when it comes to this loyalty issue. Um, next, self-realization and, and uh, self-interest. Um, uh, there's the area called ethical egoism, which is to promote own, your own self-interest. And then the predominant egoism is the strongest desire for most people most of the time is self-seeking, which a lot of people believe in. So engineers um, have proficiency motives. Many of you I know, I, I talk to people, like students all the time, I, most students really do want to be proficient. They want to be technically competent and good engineers. I mean, virtually everyone does. So we have sort of this motive of, of becoming professional, becoming highly competent, technologically competent. That's very good, okay? Um, and uh, connected with that is often the desire to serve the public. Nobody wants to hurt people. I mean, no, you know, that you're gonna you know, have people getting killed that are some, somebody's mother or, or father or kids. And you, you, nobody wants to do that, okay? So engineers are actually quite often quite serious about those issues. Uh, engineers, of course, have compensation motives. Um, you want to make money for yourself. There's nothing wrong with that or in your family. Um, support, support yourself. Uh, there's others that feel very strongly about helping their community all, also. There's also moral motives, um, a desire to do the right thing, to sort of give back. Um, there's quite a few engineers like that. Um, there's a lot of engineers that want to be have integrity. They want to do the right thing by their company, by their job, by the public, by their community. They want to be professional, okay? And why? Because, well, it feels good and it positively impacts others. Now, companies, on the other hand, they do have this sort of dual motive. That is, they want safe products, of course. I mean, no company wants to be putting out unsafe products because it ends up costing them money. They get sued. I mean, somebody um, emailed me about the GM ignition switch thing recently. This is a terrible case. I don't know, I, 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 I don't know the person that did it, but I responded to their email. And, you know, there's 19 people killed because of that ignition switch design problem. Okay? I mean, that's amazing. That's a terrible thing. That's a simple mechanical problem. Okay? Um, there's at the website at the bottom, um, there's a link to a description of the case, but it's the updates on the case are coming out all the time. They were just out last week with more results on the case. Um, there is a notion of company competence too. I don't know what you found. Uh, quite a few of you have already started looking for jobs. And you know, there's certain companies that are viewed as highly competent, right? And a lot of times that attracts engineers significantly. I mean, who wants to go work for a company that's viewed as not competent, it's, it's poor, technologically? I mean, so you as an engineer are going to be part of a company, and you're going to be part of their overall technological competence as a group, okay? And you want that to be good because, well, then your company will be respected, and you'll be respected for being a part of that company, okay? So generally people care about that a lot. And this is also connected to professional climate. Now, I have heard of problems over the years from this class of, of problems with professional climate. The climates they, that you work in as an engineer, as an intern. As an intern. Um, but most of the time, the climates are quite professional. They're, they're really quite good. And, uh, um, well, we all want that kind of environment. And if you're going to be the boss someday, you want to set a professional um, climate. All right, self-realization ethics and personal commitments. Um, this is uh, the issue of a community-oriented version of self-realization ethics. There's a lot of engineers that uh, pursue sort of self-realization, what it means you know, to make themselves a better individual, okay, is not just technology. It's people connected to technology. And um, connected to that, often they work for the embetterment of their communities, okay? So these personal commitments to these people often form the core of a person's character and motivate guide or give meaning to the work of engineers. So they wanna do something else. They might do really high tech stuff for their company 
But then on the weekend, they step out of that and they might do some technology stuff for the community. They might educate kids and so forth, okay? Um, question. Should all engineers have outside humanitarian uh, commitments to the community? Personal, this is my own view. No, I don't think it, that would it, it require, we can never, I, I say must, not, I, you can never require engineers to do volunteer work. I, I think that would be a, a, a disaster, if you ask me, um, to force anybody to do anything like that. I mean, that's like, you know, this is a free country. I mean, you can't force someone to do something like that. Um, I, it can, however, be directed within the profession, um, the company or clients, um, as part of a culture of a company, for instance, that there's significant give back to the community. A good company that's an example of that is, I don't know if you're familiar with Battelle, which is um, just south of campus. Um, this is a large technology organization. They have a very strong community um, outreach program, uh, that, uh, for instance, working with area schools and so forth. A lot of engineers get involved in that, okay? Well, that's, a, that's a good example um, of, a, of a technology company that reaches um, out. Um, but whatever's happening, the, the, these outside commitments can't adversely affect your job responsibilities, of course. So, per personal commitments and professional life. Um, a lot of times these uh, personal commitments can uh, create meaning, um, they can enliven uh, your daily work and life, and make worth, work worthwhile or life worth living. Um, they motivate professionalism throughout long careers um, with deep commitments. Um, sometimes people have certain religious beliefs um, and they're connected to this sort of thing about helping um, the community. Um, um, that's your own personal issue though. Um, with respect to engineering, um, the meaning can come from technological challenges. I don't know about you, but I love a good technological challenge. I, I don't care if you're gonna call me a nerd for saying that. I mean, I love a great technological challenge and overcoming a technological challenge, okay? That's why I'm an engineer. Um, but I'm also, personally, I'm also concerned about how engineering makes life better for others. Does it help others? Does it alleviate suffering? Does it eliminate di difficult, dangerous, or tedious toil, for instance, in a sweatshop? Um, does it make people healthier and happier? Okay. Um, is it aesthetically pleasing or intellectually enriches people? I'm concerned about things like that, too. I don't think there's anything wrong with having broader concerns. Another type of ethics that is covered in uh, not your textbook, but the other book I use for lecture is uh, by Harris. Um, is the so-called aspirational ethics, um, where there's a range of freedom in promoting human welfare. So what they highlight is they call them good engineers. They're like exemplary engineers. And they give a number of examples, and they have very high professional character. Um, they're sort of the, the best or ideal engineers. They, they sort of give their career to, um, and, and go to extraordinary means to, to, for instance, protect the safety, health, and welfare of the public to have um, high, and there's good reason then to have high um, professional um, pride. Um, they have top level competence, sort of above and beyond. They might reach out and have a social awareness um, and or an environmental um, conscientiousness. So, pro bono engineering work. Um, I talked about this just briefly. I'm just going to go over this quickly. Um, we talk about. Um, Lawyers doing pro bono work, legal. We talk about doctors do pro bono work, medical. There's also engineers. So if you're interested, this is a little plug for one of my, my own class. There's a course uh, next semester on humanitarian engineering, um, ENGR 5050. Um, yeah, here in the spring, it runs every spring semester. There's a topical outline. If you're interested in the course, I'll have, I'll have to post these slides. Um, and there's also a humanitarian engineering minor. You can look at the, the class uh, website and find that out. Um, there's also now in the College of Engineering, Humanitarian Engineering Center. We have student organizations, engineers for community service, engineers without borders, engineers for sustainable world, uh, solar education and outreach. There's courses in the service learning by these people. Um, and uh, to prepare for service trips to uh, these countries, 
Um, there's a large group, a lot of people getting involved. I'm sure there's students in this class too that are involved in this. Um, it makes, it's a lot of fun. You solve technological problems for people, go implement them um, in, for instance, um, these uh, countries. If you have questions about that, um, see me. I'm, I'm happy to discuss it with you. Um, Now, I want to talk a few minutes about this Engineers for Community Service. Um, as an organization, this is the example of engineers reaching out to their community. Um, this is an OSU College of Engineering student organization. It grew out of this class, fall offering of this class, 2003. Uh, I got together with a group of students, and we sort of decided to do this. Um, and it's been very active ever since. I think it's more active this year than any year in the past. Um, and. Uh, it's a sort of a service learning approach. There's the mission, but let me give you an example of some of the projects they do. They have local computer or IT projects with the Worthington Food Pantry. They have uh, uh, the Service Saturday software. This is uh, Excel software they've put together. Uh, they have this uh, wheelchair ramp project that's been going on for years. They have projects for the homeless for, at, with the open shelter in downtown Columbus. There's a derby car project. There's Westminster Computer Education Class Retirement Community. Um, and then there's Phone of Buckeye, where they have a group um, of uh, students that take phone calls from children around the state of Ohio about STEM questions on like their math homework or whatever. Um, they're also operating this now over uh, Facebook. Because so, students, uh, the kids like to do that. Um, ECOS has uh, three international projects. The Montani de Luz project, that's a HIV AIDS orphanage in um, Honduras. Um, and they go down and do engineering projects to try to include, include the improve the grounds of, of the orphanage. This is, this is the orphanage. Uh, this is the surrounding mountains. Uh, and that's Paula. Um, and then there's also a project in Choloteca, Honduras. And then Professor Anderson and I, the, the lady who was in, the professor who was in earlier, um, running a project to um, Colombia, um, Bogota and Pasto. Okay, uh, good timing, huh? So, attendance question. Uh, do you know of professional engineers that apply their talents in community service? Explain what they do, especially focusing on how it exploits their engineering skills and how it benefits the community. Put your name on the sheet of paper, turn it in to Veronica on your way out. Thank you.